Edward. Mr Speaker, I know that numerous MPs, particularly on the Conservative side of the House, are finding this a very difficult vote and a very difficult decision to make. So perhaps I could just briefly explain how I have gone about trying to reach my difficult conclusion on what I must do. And the first thing I ask myself is what do my voters in Wokingham want me to do? Because where they have a very strong majority for a certain conclusion, I would need an extremely good reason to disagree with them. And it is quite clear from all those who have communicated with me, talked to me, sent me emails, that there is a very big majority in Wokingham against accepting this agreement. It has brought together people who both voted Remain and voted <coughs> Leave, and they have all come to the same conclusion. They would like a different outcome afterwards, but they come to the same conclusion that this is not an agreement that the United Kingdom should in any circumstances sign up to. The national polling reflects this as well, and that is why it is a matter of interest, I think, to all members in this House, that this agreement has somewhere between 15 and 25 per cent support on a very good day in a favourable poll. So roughly four out of five people have considered it and think it is a very bad idea, and I would urge all to bear that in mind before they finally cast their, their vote this afternoon. The second thing I ask myself is what have I and my party promised my electors in Wokingham and the wider electorate in the United Kingdom that we serve? And there again, it is very clear that I and the National Manifesto in 2017, which then gave me my mandate, said that we would see Brexit through, that it would take two years after the formal notification had been received, that no deal was better than a bad deal, that of course we would do our best to get a really good deal, which was our, our preference. And the manifesto of the National Conservative Party wisely said that the government would negotiate both parts together. Any withdrawal issues would be negotiated in parallel with the future trading arrangement and the future partnership. And how wise that was, because at that point the government and our leader understood that there would be compromises made, and if you were going to make concessions in the withdrawal bit, you wanted the good news in the partnership bit to be nailed down at the same time. And unfortunately, the government changed its mind about that shortly after the general election, and that has let the public down, because it means that we haven't used the purchase of all the concessions the government made in the withdrawal agreement to nail down what is needed in their view for the future partnership agreement. And I feel very bad about that. And I have to say to my electors that in order to get closer to what I and the government promised, I have to say no to half of the total agreement when it is so obviously weighted very strongly against the United Kingdom and against our interests. But then I come to the third thing. Um, my electors elected me, and they elected me to exercise my judgment. They expect me to read all the documents and understand the background and study major matters for myself. And on this happy occasion, their view and my view coincide. That I have studied all the documents. I have followed very closely the negotiations. I have offered a great deal of advice to the Prime Minister and her team. Much of it, I am afraid, has not been taken. And thus, we are where we are, as the Attorney General said. But my study of the documents tells me this, that the withdrawal agreement is not leaving the European Union, that were it to pass, it will be followed by an extremely bad piece of legislation which recreates all the powers of the European Union and applies them to us for a period of between two and four years. We won't even be told for how long, because it's in the gift of the European Union and the negotiations, and that we might end up having to accept a large amount of the rules and the trading arrangements in perpetuity because of the most unfortunate Irish backstop which has been placed in, and because none of us want to break up our country, it would mean the only way we could fulfil the requirements of this solemn treaty would be for the whole United Kingdom to stay in all the arrangements that the EU demanded. And the agreement would mean that for a period of at least two years and maybe four years, 
the European Union could negotiate in any way it saw fit over an extremely wide range of issues, not just related to business and trade. And this House of Commons would have no voice and no vote and no right to do anything other than implement it faithfully and fully uh, without us amending it or even complaining through a, a reputable mechanism. And I don't see how anyone could possibly inflict that upon a great country which has recently voted to be sovereign, yeah, to take yeah, back right. control. I do not see how this House could possibly vote for this agreement uh, when it has open-ended financial commitments on an enormous scale. The Treasury has, I think, very optimistically priced them at a pretty big £39 billion. But there are no numbers in the agreement. There is no agreement about the bills that will be set. And there is a mechanism which allows the EU to send us bills under very broad headings, and then with a system of referee to try and deal with disagreements, heavily weighted in favour of the EU, with any legal matter being resolved by the European Court of Justice. Now, who on earth would agree to pay unlimited, unknown bills and not have genuinely independent arbitration over the purpose? And when will the government give us any purpose for offering to pay all this money? Because they are in this absurd position, because of the way they've handled the negotiation, that they've decided to pay the money, but they haven't secured any goods or services in return for it. Now, when I go shopping, I don't put £39 on the counter and say to the, the shop, that is your money, whatever happens next. Now can we, for the next 21 months, have a discussion about whether you're going to let me have anything in return for my £39. But that, unfortunately, is what we're being asked to approve in this agreement this afternoon, Mr Speaker. So, in conclusion, for me, it turns out to be an easy decision. I'm sorry for a lot of my right honourable and honourable friends, it is not so easy. I never find it easy to vote against the government I want to support. And in this Parliament, I very rarely voted against the government I want to support. But on this one issue, I have voted against the government before, and I will vote against it again this afternoon, because this is a dreadful agreement. It is a fully binding treaty with no exit clause, something we can't get out of, and there would be requirement after requirement after requirement. We would have subcontracted our legislation to someone we can't control and we no. have to obey, no. and we'd offered them to pay them for a lot of money for no obvious good reason. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Hillary Benn.